Hello, and welcome back to A Gross of Physics. Today we're going to cover day six, speed and velocity. The two terms, speed and velocity, are often used um, synonymously in everyday language. And this is another example where in physics there's a specific distinction between the two words that in the English language um, that may become muddied. Now speed is how fast an object is moving. We have a couple of different versions of speed, but typically it's how fast an object is going to go from point A to point B. We can do an average of the speed, and that would be called average speed. Um, we can calculate that using an equation. And the equation we would use is the distance divided by the time. If we were traveling at a speed limit, that would tell us how fast we were allowed to go. So for example, in, in the English units, um, the speed limit may be 30 miles per hour, maybe 55 miles per hour. It may even be 65 or 75 miles per hour. In the metric units, it might be in kilometers per hour. And that'll tell you how fast you're allowed to go um, at any given moment. Now, average speed would take into account um, times that you're slowing down, times that you're speeding up, times that you're taking a break, maybe at a rest light or a, um, or a stop sign. Um, so the average time would be the total time for the entire trip um, and the distance you travel. So for example, if I travel 100 miles and it takes me, let's just say, two hours to get to where I'm going, and that includes all the slowing down, starting, and all the different um, por portions of my trip, that would be 100 miles divided by two hours or I travel an average of 50 miles per hour. This is how um, speeds can be calculated using uh, GPS technology with, um, let's say, an easy pass system, uh, like in New York State, where you travel on a highway and you pay an automated uh, toll based on when you get on the highway and where you get off the highway. Included in that are timestamps. When a car enters the beginning toll uh, booth, the timestamp will go at, let's say, noon. When you reach the destination, maybe you're traveling on the thruway and you travel to Buffalo. Well, it would say a specific time that you got to Buffalo. It would calculate your fee based on the exit you started and the exit you ended. Well, in that data is also the distance between the two um, destinations. What can be calculated from that is the average speed of the vehicle during that trip. So if the distance between your original destination or original location and Buffalo is known, um, whatever exit you start at and whatever exit you end at, then what would happen is it would be just a simple calculation to divide the two to find your average speed. Unfortunately, that would not tell you how fast you were going at any given moment of time. That would just tell you the average speed over the whole trip. It's possible that you stopped at a rest area, um, got gas, maybe got some food, took a, took a nap. Um, maybe there was traffic and it took you longer to go through a certain section because you had to slow down for that point. The average speed does not tell you specific information about variables that are smaller time frames. It just tells you a, a general overview. Now mathematically, the equation is V equals D over T to find average speed. V is speed, and we'll see why it's not S in a moment. D is distance, and T is time. We use the bar over the V to represent the average. In math class, often you use it as mean. Uh, mean and average are synonymous. But in this case, we'll use V bar equals D over T to represent average speed. Now, I was alluding to the fact that we have certain values that um, tell us a more specific speed at a given time. I think it's important that we do another, let's do a practice problem about um, finding the speed of an object. And we'll use the particle accelerator at CERN as our um, location. And I did some research and I found the size of the um, track for the particle accelerator and how often the particles move along the track. Basically what a particle accelerator is, is a device where we take charged particles and we accelerate them at high rates of speed. Typically, they're uh, subatomic, protons, 
neutrons, although that wouldn't be a charged particle, maybe the neutrons sitting in one spot and we're bombarding them with protons. And what we're trying to do is uh, effectively destroy them, uh, annihilate them so we see what the proton is made up of. And that's one of the ways that quarks were discovered um, in the uh, mid-1900s. But enough of that for now. What I just want to do at this point is determine the average speed of protons in this particle accelerator. So I'd like you to take a few moments and make that calculation. And then what we'll do is go through the math and see how you did. Now, the most important part of this is determining what frequency means because we haven't discussed that yet. Now the frequency is the number of cycles an object does something in a certain number of seconds. So it's typically cycles per second. Now frequency has a fancy unit instead of cycles per second which is typically 1 over s or s to the negative 1 if you want to get a little fancier with your math um, in terms of your notation. We use the Hertz instead. So Hertz represents 1 over seconds. Now, you'll realize that seconds is what time is measured in. We talked about that when we talked about the metric system. Well, in order to get 1 over seconds into seconds, we have to do a math function we call the reciprocal. So we have to reciprocate that number. So we take the frequency and we do 1 over that value, and that will get us the time period. The distance was measured in kilometers, so we were able to use um, the conversion to meters. And when we divide the value for the distance and the value for the time, we can find the average speed of the protons in the particle accelerator to be 2.94 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And that's almost the speed of light. The speed of light is something we'll discuss in more detail later on in the course, but it is the, the absolute speed limit of our universe. As far as we know, we cannot exceed that value. Um, mathematically, it would take an infinite amount of energy to go faster than the speed of light. Um, it would be, it would make an object infinitely massive, and time would get a little um, thrown off at those speeds as well. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail later, but for our purposes right now, I want you to realize that any number that you get that's bigger than the speed of light, which happens to be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, is probably wrong. Um, in this case, we have 2.94, so we're just shy of the speed of light, and the only reason we're able to get protons to move that fast is because they're so light. But as the proton moves at that speed, it's actually um, assuming a larger mass um, as it travels. Now, this is uh, definitely a cutting-edge area of physics, um, something that we're not going to cover in too much detail in... Um, in an introductory physics course. However, it's important to realize that finding the speed of protons in something as complex as a particle accelerator is just simply distance over time. Anyone who's traveled in a car uh, or has a speedometer on a bike or maybe has, has ri uh, ridden on a, uh, a treadmill or ran on a treadmill or something like that, you have speed values that are given as you're moving. Those speed values are your distance divided by your time. Mathematically, the computer inside, um, possibly the treadmill, or uh, the, the computer inside the car's uh, workings for the speedometer is just taking distance values and dividing it by time. For the car, it's using the rotation of the tires. Uh, for a bicycle, it would be rotation of the tires. So if you actually change the size of the tires, that would affect your speedometer. It would also affect your odometer as well, which tells you how far you've traveled. Um, but those values are a simple calculation of distance over time. Now, going back to the other types of speed, there is the speed at every given instant. And if you actually look at your speedometer, it tells you how fast you're going at any given time. If you travel past a police officer and you're traveling at 45 miles per hour and it's supposed to be 30, they will be able to detect that instantaneous speed and possibly pull you over. If you travel fast for a section and average velocities calculated, and then you take a break, and then you travel fast again for another section and take a break, the average velocity will not um, take into account how fast you are going at every given moment of time. So instantaneous is really what your speedometer tells you. 
Um, there's a way to do that graphically. And what we'll be able to do is find the slope of a tangent line when we do the graphical analysis. So an object that may be accelerating will have a curve to it. We'll be able to draw a tangent line on that curve. And finding the slope of that tangent line will tell us the instantaneous speed at that moment. Those of us who may be taking calculus or have taken calculus already, it is the derivative of the position function that will tell us our instantaneous speed. So calculus can be used to do this as well. We're going to stick to just simply d over t or possibly drawing a tangent line and finding the slope. But effectively finding the slope is the same thing as doing distance over time. We'll talk about that more later. Now, on the other hand, we have a variable we call velocity. Now, most people would consider those to be the same thing, speed and velocity. However, velocity is what we consider to be a vector, where speed is a scalar. And it has nothing to do with the fact that speed starts with s and velocity starts with v. It has to do with the fact that a scalar and a vector are two different variables. A scalar is a variable that has magnitude only. So, for example, if I look at my speedometer, 30 miles per hour is my speed. Now, if I take that information and I look at, let's say, the compass on my console, or maybe I have a compass on my dashboard, that would tell me the direction I'm traveling as well. So perhaps I'm going 30 miles per hour north, or 30 miles per hour northeast, or even 30 miles per hour south. Well, now I've taken my speed and I've turned it into a velocity. So a velocity is a, is a variable um, that has a speed and the direction the object is traveling as well. So it's speed and direction combined. Now, a vector quantity um, involves having a displacement instead of a distance. Well, distance was how far I went. Displacement, on the other hand, is how far I go in a particular direction. So I can go in a circle and my displacement would be zero because I'm no distance from where I started. However, the distance I traveled, if we're talking about a circle, would be the circumference of the circle in which I traveled. So even words like distance and displacement can have different meanings, although in English we'd probably use it as the same term. We'd use it synonymously. So the way we're going to calculate um, displacement is by using or I'm sorry, velocity is by using displacement divided by time. Now, if you think about it, time, we haven't talked about a um, alternative version that has a direction. Time does not have um, direction associated with it. So time is what we consider a scalar quantity. Distance and speed are scalars as well. They don't have directions. Um, displacement and velocity, those, those would be vectors. So those have direction. Now. The symbol for displacement, we're going to use a D still. Um, but I wanted you to be aware of the fact that um, in some textbooks, in some uh, other versions of the course, uh, other people's point of view, for example, they will use an S for displacement. I learned displacement as an S. Um, and that got a little confusing with speed when I, when I learned this the first time. But um, I want you to be aware of the fact that V equals S over T would also be useful for finding the velocity. V is still velocity, um, but V was also speed. Now, how do we denote the difference? Well, you'll notice on the notes here that the velocity has a half arrow symbol on top of it. So the half arrow symbol represents a vector quantity. So as soon as you see that, that half arrow, um, you'll see that you'll want to have a direction associated with it. So in this case, when I do my calculation, I would have displacement. Now maybe I travel 30 miles east and I travel for five seconds. Well, that's going to be a pretty high rate of speed, but 30 divided by five would be six miles per second in this case. But that would be the speed. If I wanted to turn it into a velocity, it would be six miles per second east. So the difference between speed and velocity is adding a direction at the end. So as soon as I add the direction, I have a velocity, which is a vector. If I don't have a direction associated with it, I have a scalar. In that case, I would have speed. So some examples of speeds versus velocities. If I had 10 miles per hour east, that would be 
a velocity, has a direction. 40 knots south-southeast. You'll often hear that with wind um, speeds, uh, or in this case, wind velocities. 10 kilometers per hour at 30 degrees north of west. That's another example of a velocity. If I look at my speedometer, um, 30 miles per hour, that'll tell me a speed. 50 kilometers per hour, that's a speed. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, the speed of light. All of those do not have direction. Now you could add a direction to the, you know, whatever direction light's traveling and turn it into the velocity of light. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, east or south or northwest. So if you're looking at a speedometer, that'll tell you your speed. That's where the term comes from, speed o meter. As opposed to if I'm looking at a GPS, that will probably tell me my velocity. It will not just tell me how fast I'm going, but it will tell me how fast I'm going in a particular direction. Now it's important to, I think, write down the difference between vectors and scalars so we don't get confused. So the way we're going to define a vector is by saying a vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Um, the magnitude is the size of the number, or it's the number. It always has to have a unit, but it'll, it'll be the number part. So 30 or 50 or 70 or 100 or 1,000. The other important part is that you include the direction it's traveling. So it could be east, it could be uh, west, it could be on an XY coordinate system, it could be uh, 30 degrees, 90 degrees, 270 degrees. It could even be on a three-dimensional plane, and then we'd have to worry about having X, Y, and possibly Z coordinates as well. On the other hand, um, a scalar is a quantity that just has magnitude, so 30 grams. A mass of an object would be 30 grams, and that is a scalar quantity. doesn't have 30 grams east, doesn't have 30 grams north, it does not have 30 grams west. It's just 30 grams. So a scalar will not have a direction associated to it. A vector, on the other hand, will. Now, that should conclude for today our discussion of velocity and speed. And really, underlying that discussion is our discussion of vectors and scalars. The calculation is V equals D over T. If we're finding the speed, the D is distance. If we're finding velocity, the D will be displacement. And we'll use the half arrow over the top to denote the difference between whether or not we need a direction or whether or not we don't. Um, if we have no arrow, there's a scalar, so we don't need direction. If there is an arrow, we need the direction, and it will become a vector quantity. So that concludes our discussion today of velocity versus speed. Thank you.